Good Thursday morning, and welcome to Ice Age TV, the internal combustion engine age YouTube channel that talks about all my cars and trucks and motorcycles, the SUVs, the dualies, the fast Johnny, the ST, the breakout, the low rider, the bicycles, life. Wow, is it Thursday? Is it Thursday? Hey, good Thursday morning there. It's hard for me to believe it's Thursday. Is it Thursday? Wow, I just can't believe it's Thursday. But hey, it's always Thank you so much for all, all those that tune into my channel and watch me uh, talk about things and share my life's adventures, my antics, my craziness. Yeah, my craziness, even for me, to come down to Florida, spend the amount of money I just spent to buy that F-450. Not really the wisest decision being on, on, on vacation. Beyond believable of what played out with that F-450. And it's sitting in my neighbor's driveway. And here you have the spies, the commies among us, that, you know, at one point someone will put a little sticker on the windshield or a piece of paper and say, you can't park your truck in the driveway. But sincerely, for all my YouTube subscribers, which looks better in the driveway? The F-450 or the, is that a Lexus over there? I'm not even sure what that car is. Toyota, not sure. Which would you pick? I mean, which would you rather have in your driveway? That nice big truck or that smaller vehicle? You know, look at the vehicle of the F-450. Look at the size, the weight. How much does that truck weigh? How much does that vehicle weigh? And you know what I thought to myself this morning is what better conversation than to talk about weight? And I don't think we've had a weight conversation. And in so many ways, we live in the, in the world of weight, the weight that's upon us. If you kind of get that, you always have the weight in your shoulders. But the atmospheric pressures, the world of the air and uh, the, everything above us keeps us on the ground here. You know, you have weight being pushed down your body day in, day out in the world we live. Uh, because if you go 300 miles um, upward, if you're standing here, I go 300 miles north, uh, eventually I'm going to be uh, breaking the atmosphere here, and then you are weightless. Meaning, uh, if you watch the uh, astronauts and people go into space, you start floating around. So whether it does or not, you have weight being pressed down your body every day. Not just your worries, financial challenges, your life, you know, just overall life. You always have a weight on your shoulders, as they say, right? But in so many ways, that's physically correct because the, uh, the pressures of air, the oxygen, and uh, all the other elements that make up this universe that we live in, this planet Earth, are keeping you uh, planted on the ground. And, you know, I've got my warmer clothes on because it's actually not cold, but it's cooler, so good thing I brought some of my extra clothes. But I thought to myself, weight. The weight would be conversation, because what goes along with weight is the uh, greenhouse emissions. That is a term called carbon dioxide, the CO2, the carbon footprint that we live in and that us humans create, and Mother Nature as well. So it's just not us creating carbon dioxide challenges, but it's all aspects of uh, life here on uh, planet Earth. But you need that as well for things to uh, survive. If people understand the carbon dioxide, oxygen for plants and animals, or I should say marine life and blah, blah, blah. And the oceans create most of the CO2 or whatever. So uh, it gets kind of really deep. And I'm not a scientist. I'm not the professor. Never have said on my channel I'm the smartest, smartest of the bunch. I never have made that claim, just for the record. I wonder where I put my Ice Age TV stickers. I bought a, brought a whole stack down. I think I put them in my car, my uh, motorcycle trailer, because I need to put some stickers in my brand new Ford F450 over here. And yeah, so here it is. You know, what do you think this thing weighs? I think this truck weighs in at like 9,000 pounds. And what's crazy is, as you know, these trucks these days can pull 20, 30,000 pounds. And until you pull a trailer, and you, t you pull that type of weight, which I never have. I've pulled 12,000 pound, 14,000 uh, pound trailers. I've never pulled 20 or 30, but you know that's a lot of weight behind you when you have a vehicle that weighs, let's just say 9,500 pounds, and yet you're pulling down the road behind it something that maybe is double the weight. <laughs> yeah, you kind of get that once you pull a trailer, especially if you have a smaller SUV or whatever it may be, if you have like a four or 5,000 pound uh, a vehicle and you're towing an 8,000 pound um, trailer, you learn very quickly you're pulling something twice the size 
of that vehicle that then uh, radiates back to you and your driving habits. So, but the biggest thing that we uh, are challenged today is we have the carbon dioxide greenhouse, green agenda um, challenges. And you, sometimes you have to think to yourself, uh, what, you know, what is going on with the carbon dioxide? What does that really mean? What is what you're told is us individuals that you emit in the U.S. 16 ton of uh, greenhouse emissions, carbon dioxide. That's a fact. So for us Americans, we are the, the worst in the green agenda's uh, views and eyes of the greenhouse emissions where we, we emit 16 tons. But you have to say to yourself, what is a ton? Well, a ton is 2,284 pounds of, uh, of weight. And you just have to say to yourself, wow, you mean us humans are emitting 16 tons times 2,200? What's that, like 34,000 pounds? You're, you're emitting 34,000 pounds of a carbon footprint to the atmosphere uh, each year. And that's just an average. Some will be more, some will be less. So if you took that number, that's like basically close to four of those trucks I guess in weights, but when you come to volume, you come to the volume of carbon footprint, they kind of look at a, a bubble or a house. So what they say is that if you took a house, you could kind of compare that maybe to close to a carbon footprint. And so if you're like a ton of a carbon footprint on volume, it's more of the balloon, but it's in some aspect, just picture um, not a real big house, maybe a little smaller house, but just picture that you have emitted 16 of these homes in volume of carbon dioxide in one year. So if you just started counting from the, the end of the street here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 11, I can't even count. You're way, way, way down the block, and that's what you have, com that's what you have, uh, have created through being on this physical world, if you're driving cars and trucks and motorcycles. But you know what's really interesting is, what would you think is the bigger carbon dioxide uh, or the carbon footprint, um, uh, which contributes more in the in like the motor vehicle world? If you kind of look around, so you get the, you have like the motorcycles and cars and trucks, and you have the big heavy duty trucks. And would you think that the big heavy duty trucks emit more of the greenhouse emissions or less? And believe it or not, the number one culprit of our in our country is these light duty. I know that's not a light duty truck, but the light duty trucks um, contribute more, a lot more than heavy duty commercial trucks do, and the boats and the airplanes. So yes, in our society, this country, the majority of the uh, CO2 issues is the light duty trucks, and then next in line is actual the uh, the vehicle, the cars, the non trucks, the SUVs. So wow, so isn't that something to think that in our country, that our love and passion for what, I have a YouTube channel that just revolves every day of its life around the cars and trucks, motorcycles, that these light trucks and these cars are the number one problem on the amount of carbon footprint. And once again, I thought, you know, for us in today's world, all we hear is this constant chatter of the greenhouse agenda um, you know, the green, the green agenda, I should say the, the, the emissions agenda, the carbon footprint, the, what mankind is doing to this world and how the, the scientists believe how we're making the atmosphere thinner, which creates in the end, the sun can break through and you don't get as much protection from the, uh, our atmospheric, um, makeup and then it changes the, uh, the temperature of the, what we, you know, think it should be versus what it's going to be and wow and wow and wow right so so but here's another thing too though kind of brought that up in the conversation earlier than later versus when you say to yourself and you're buying something and i think to myself on the ice age versus the electric age so i'm not back at home so those that don't really know my channel wouldn't know that i have an electric vehicle called f-150 i have a mustang mach e those are both the electric vehicles. So those that watch my channel all the time, they know back up north that I have those cars. And today I'd be doing a walk around both of those saying, let's look at the weight comparisons of what goes on with the electric vehicle. Because I've always have laughed at how the fact that people buy electric vehicles, and don't take it the wrong way, 
I'm not being mean. I'm just saying, even for me, it's kind of an irony. When you go buy an electric vehicle, the amount of carbon footprint that was used to create that vehicle is a su substantial amount of carbon footprint. And the running joke has been for many years, you have to drive a Tesla like 40 plus thousand miles as before you really accomplish you contributing from that point on, not emitting the carbon footprint like an ICE vehicle would. But the point is, you take an F-150 truck that's basically a gas engine setup, four-door, like that F-150 power boost truck I had, and that truck's going to probably be about a 5,800-pound truck specced out the way it is with like a 32-gallon tank. But then you take the F-150 Lightning truck specced out with all the luxuries the same way, and that's going to probably be about a 1,000-pound more truck. So it's going to be 6,800 pounds. Um, you go to the Ford Mustang uh, Mach-E versus the Ford Mustang. You take a Ford Mustang that isn't supercharged, uh, it's about a 4,000, 4,200-pound vehicle, uh, giving how you option it out, automatic versus manual, uh, and all the technology, what size tires and wheels. But then you go to the Ford Mustang Mach-E, and it's basically close to 5,000 pounds. So in some ways, it's close to a 1,000-pound difference. Um, so what I'm kind of getting at is it's very interesting to kind of compare the ICE vehicles in comparison to the electric vehicles. And I've talked about this before in my videos uh, previously. And you have a much heavier footprint. You have a you know, a, you know more weight of a vehicle that uh, you just purchase. That's uh, you know in some ways, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And what do I mean by that? Well, when you look at the roads, the infrastructure, anybody knows that drives down these heavy, heavy duty use roads, you get all these imperfections of the uh, the road because of the heavy duty trucks sinking into the asphalt and really making like <laughs> people know this stuff to drive a car when you go down the road. Whole point is these electric vehicles they require special tires why because they're a very heavy vehicle um if you're a, a guy that um, loads up trucks every day of your life you'll deliver them to dealerships are you are you able to load up a whole load of f-150 lightning trucks and go down the road legally versus loading up f-150 ice vehicles and i don't really know for sure on all that but my inclination would be that as a truck driver, you may not be able to put, let's just say, 12 F-150 Lightnings on your truck. You may be able to put 8 or 10. But ICE F-150s, you probably can put um, 12 because you're going to have a heavier load. Think about 1,000 pounds more. Um, that's 4,000 pounds more for four more trucks. Is that your braking limit? I don't know. I'm just speaking out loud at the tip of my tongue. Um, but then you think about the fuel tank storage on the weight versus a battery pack. And I think most people would all say, well, when you add in the wheel motors and the battery pack, there's your 1,000-pound difference over a gas engine and a fuel tank. So if you take this truck here, it has like a 48-gallon fuel tank. So there you go. Let's talk about weight, weight and fuel. And uh, yesterday, we, you know, we've had the conversation this week of the watch, the view, the, the view, and then the uh, the fuel, the fuel conversations yesterday. And I was talking about how you don't see gasoline or diesel per se, but here's the thing. When you look at the, uh, the weights of fuel, it's like aviation fuel, I believe, is the lightest fuel. But then like gasoline, I believe, is like, is like close to seven gallons. It's like six gallons, six, for one gallon of gasoline, it's like six pounds, roughly. For diesel fuel, it's like seven pounds for a gallon. So if you look at the truck over here, it has a, let's just say it has a 50 gallon tank. That's 350 pounds of weight when I put, when I fill the truck up and that 350 pounds of weight without towing anything in that truck there is gonna probably take me about 600 miles. But when you go to like water, water is like eight pounds per gallon. That's why anybody that's uh, had water in their fuel tank especially like in the gas station industry, um, water always settles at the bottom. And when you have this ethanol uh, product in your cars, people know that if you let ethanol-based uh, gas, or I, sh I should say when you buy gasoline today and you have like a 10% um, mixture of ethanol, if you let the gasoline set for a while, three things happen to that uh, product. It eventually separates, and it separates typically into the gasoline, the ethanol, and then the water. And that's why it's a huge problem in small engine, engine uh, in motorcycles, cars. If you let gas 
sit around too long untreated, it separates those three properties. So it goes back. So anyways, the whole point of that is then you've got a problem because, because water is at the bottom of the tank. And typically, on most vehicles, the bottom of the tank is where the pickup is to get the fuel to the motor. If you look at these motorcycles here, we got usually like the pet cock there in the bottom of the tank. So if you let this bike sit for six months to a year and never treat the fuel, the odds are you're going to have water is going to be the first thing that comes out of this gas tank with the ethanol, and then the gas is going to be last. It's not going to run very long. It's actually going to turn off. This is what's interesting. A guy yesterday literally on my YouTube channel reached out and asked me about that CVO 23 that I bought and I traded for the Fast Johnny. Everybody's watched my channel. I gave up a CVO 23, the new design that I bought last, uh, like, August. Traded in, well, Fast Johnny. Gentleman there, I guess, watches my channel. He went to the dealership up there at Chesapeake uh, Eisenhower in Darlington, Maryland, and he reached out and said, any issues with his motorcycle? And for me, you know, that's sometimes kind of a hard answer because I don't want to deter the individual from buying a motorcycle. I don't want to misrepresent the Harley dealer or presenting a motorcycle. So I thought, you know, how do you answer that when for me, I think that variable valve timing setup on that motor is a challenge. And it's a known fact for variable valve timing. Motors throughout the years have had these issues where the bike starts or the car starts and it idles and then it shuts off. And then the next time around, it's more challenging to start it because of that technology. If you watch my channel, if you go and look it up, on how there's a solenoid switch that's pushing back and forth the cam with different lobes on what's the most efficient way to run the bike with the ECM. So anyways, I responded to the guy. I said, you know, no issues besides the VVT, I believe, needs to be primed two or three times. And some of you be like, primed? What do you mean by that? Well, if you listen to these uh, motorcycles start up, they've got electric uh, fuel pumps on them. So when you turn it on, That usually is like the fuel pump shooting fuel into the uh, injectors in the motor to get it to start. So what I kind of figured out there later in that bike was take the bike, turn it on, and turn it off, and then turn it on, and do that two or three times to cycle getting a lot of pressure of fuel, I guess, in that motor. And I don't think you're going to have that problem because I kind of did that a few times. So I told myself, I think that... You have to cycle the fuel uh, two or three times, I think, to get overcome that thing where it just wouldn't start. It would start, then it would die. Uh, I'm not the expert on that. I could be wrong. But anyway, so I reached out to him and told him that, and he was very appreciative. Did he buy the bike? I have no idea. Would it maybe make you be hesitant, hesitant to buy it? Um, yeah, I would probably be like, huh. But the guy I used to own it's telling me that the bike would turn off, turn off, turn on, but turn off. And then it would have a very challenging time to start back up. And when I had it at the Harley dealer, they looked at it. They couldn't see any. They couldn't reproduce it. They couldn't see any codes. So to them, they don't really know what's going on. So it's brand new. You're the guinea pig. I said that from the get-go. And that's why I love this bike. It doesn't have the valve, real valve timing. But anyways, back to the weights. So you're, you're looking at the, uh, at the fuel, the weight of fuel the, versus the weight of uh, a battery pack. And that's a huge challenge. That's the biggest challenge in the battery pack industry, which behind the scenes, these battery manufacturers, automotive industry is diligently working on how to make these batteries lighter and have more range. In fact, even Chrysler is showing some new sulf, sulf, sulfur lithium battery that's supposed to be um, get, rid of, get rid of the magnesium, the cobalt, the iron. It's supposed to be a more efficient better priced and lighter weight battery that Chrysler hopes by 2028, 2027 to bring the market to make it so the battery is less expensive. You don't need to use all these raw materials of the world because there's abundance of sulfur, uh, apparently, or whatever. So it's a lot of, anybody watch my channel, anybody's abreast to today's world of technology, there's a lot going on behind the scenes as we try to change the greenhouse emissions which right here is the number one culprit of creating the greenhouse emissions. And it's the number one thing on the radar screen day in, day out in our, in our lives that the governing bodies and the green agenda activists are trying to change 
on what you and I can own because I guess it's two was it two pounds of or two pounds of carbon footprint for every uh, every mile driven for whatever vehicle you drive or they say one gallon of gasoline burned up in this vehicle is equivalent to 19 um, pounds of CO2, which that's pretty like, wow. On the diesel side, one gallon of diesel fuel burn is like 22 pounds. And you know, you think to yourself, pounds, you're actually talking about real pounds. You're saying that if I had a weight in here in my garage, I think I do, and this is where to me, some of you may know a little better on this because I'm not the scientist by any means, but I'm, I'm thinking to myself, here's like 10 pounds. Here's, here's 10 pounds. So you're saying that when you drive this vehicle and burn up one gallon of uh, fuel, two of these dumbbells is the amount of carbon footprint weight that has been emitted into the atmosphere? I mean, that's where I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's really... The carbon footprint, the carbon weight, I don't think that's the way it really is, even though they claim that us humans are emitting 2,284 pounds of carbon footprint um, in one ton. So if we're burning, you know, 16, if we're emitting 16 um, tons of a carbon footprint, I just said it, that's like 34,000 pounds. Which that's, okay, I, th I think that's correct. I could be wrong, but you know, I saved something on my phone, which uh, I want to read, because uh, I think that the weights around us is more than ever the uh, conversation. So, let's see here. So this here shows you right here how much tailpipe di carbon dioxide is emitted from driving one mile the average passenger vehicle emits about 411 grams of CO2 per mile. This number can vary based on two factors, the fuel economy and a vehicle the amount of uh, carbon in the vehicle's fuel. So it was 411 grams. Um, you know, what is that in, in conversion to a pound? Um, I don't know. So then here's another thing. What is the carbon footprint? Carbon footprint... Um, a measure of the amount of carbon dioxide and other carbon compound, compounds emitted due to the consumption of fossil fuels by a particular person, group, etc. Um, carbon footprint is the total amount of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide and methane, that are generated by our actions. Um, let's see here. So the average carbon footprint um, for a person in the United States is 16 tons, one of the highest rates in the world. The average footprint is closer to four tons. So, you know, once again, you just, oh, oh my gosh. And, and, and for me, so much on my YouTube channel, boy, I got some noisy birds out of They just probably tired of me talking, right? So, um, you just, we just hear this constant carbon footprint uh, term, and where Elon Musk was enriched himself. Look at this here. This is getting wound up. Or one, two. Jeez. Yeah. What are they doing, huh? What are those guys up to? So anyways, uh, so for like Elon Musk, think about how much carbon footprint en enriched him. Elon Musk has been enriched by the carbon footprint agendas. It's beyond believable. What Elon Musk, is very, I give the guy credit for being very smart on taking advantage of the world governing bodies of, you know, really forcing a hand to all these manufacturers to have to pay for these, uh, the carbon footprint emissions, greenhouse emissions um, challenges in our world and how Elon Musk enriched them by selling carbon footprint tax credits. I've talked about that numerous times on my channel. I'm sure many understand that. And Elon Musk, who's the uh, the net zero, the green of the green, supposedly, and for the manufacturers, they had to buy his leftover carbon, foot, uh, carbon footprint uh, credits and they would pay him two, three hundred million dollars, five hundred million dollars, because it would be less money to pay him than to pay the government penalties. What I'm talking about. Um, but you go back to the weights. So here, here's all the talk of this CVOST that was just kind of came out of nowhere back in the big reveal of Harley Davidson this year. And and what was it all about? It was all about the weight. It was all about the weight savings. 
of this motorcycle being like 20 pounds lighter than the CVL. And how did they accomplish that? Well, we've talked about that throughout the channel. And number one is the CVO has rear speakers. This doesn't. This has the carbon fiber treatment on it. This has the carbon fiber front fender. Um, so we've gone through that before talking about this motorcycle, why this bike is 20 pounds lighter than the regular CVO. But in the motorcycle world, um, that's significant. In the car racing world, you look at that Camaro Z28 I just bought a week ago, Tuesday. Hard to believe. It's so hard for me to believe. You think about this. Four vehicle purchases since January. We have four vehicle purchases. You're talking about the CVO ST, and then you're talking about the Grove Glide, Fast Johnny. Then back up north, you're talking about a Camaro Z28 Black 2015. And then I come down here, and you're talking about a Ford F450 truck. That's four purchases. I told everybody back in January, my goal was not to be what I did last year and buy 33 vehicles. It really is not my goal. But here we go again, right? I'm already at four. I go back home by a tractor. I'm at five. And then what else is sitting around for the deal? <laughs> yeah, I know. It, doesn't, it just doesn't end. Um, but back to the weights, it's just like the Camaro. I was talking about that Camaro. It's like a 3,800-pound and change Camaro. Uh-oh. I thought it was the kid for a second and Poppy. So anyways, a 3,800-pound uh, interesting uh, vehicle. And, and in racing, you know that comes, and that was what was special about that Camaro, is they removed the rear um, trunk liners for the insulation of the car. Um, I mean, there's a whole list of things. It has an all-aluminum uh, motor in it. So there's just a lot of things to make that car just at 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 200 pounds lighter that makes a huge difference. And anybody that's doing um, quarter-mile racing, eighth-mile racing, that they know that every bit of weight that you can get out of that car can make the difference of just that one-tenth of a second difference that makes the difference of you um, being the fastest guy on the track on keeping your times consistent. So it's just incredible on in how we live in a world that the weight upon our shoulders, which is every day of our life because of gravity and the atmospheric pressures that are around us, but in the weight of us to get out of bed and go to work and take care of the financial responsibilities, the kid, the wife, the job, and, you know, that weighs on you. But also the weight of these vehicles that we all are so attached to and we all so much love. And I can say from just so many years of owning so many different cars and vehicles, it's, it's substantial on how a vehicle feels on the weights and if the weight is balanced that's a whole other variable when you go into the racing of cars is what's the distribution of the, the weight of the vehicle from the front to back to the power ratio i mean it's all weight related and for the motorcycles you know as i progress in life get older these are heavy motorcycles and sure i can handle bikes i mean it isn't that they're too heavy for me but these are this is basically 900 pound Motorcycle right here. You know, over here, this motorcycle is a 900-pound motorcycle. This bike over here, this is more like the 500-pound range. This bike here, believe it or not, is close to 700 pounds. So, for those people on my channel, like, like the, Mr. Sanchez that watches my channel a lot, he uh, he really thinks my daughter Julia should be riding this fast Johnny. Well, you know, believe it or not, my daughter just isn't excited about that. She really isn't. She loves her lowrider ST. She's more focused on the breakout. She just really isn't ready for that, that heavy a bike because that's 200 pounds more of a bike. It's hard to believe looking at the bikes, but if I'm correct, this Lowrider ST is like a 700-pound motorcycle, and this motorcycle here, it may be 850. I could be off a little bit, but you're talking 150 pounds, and that's a lot of weight for a young lady that's still kind of getting going in her motorcycle and, you know, you want the good experiences. You want to, you want to put your – think about life that you learn. I, you know, I used to coach basketball, youth girls basketball. You want to try to put a person in a winning environment, not a losing environment. Because we all know that when you're a loser, it's, uh, it's tough. It's tough to take when you lose. I, mean, I can so remember when I was coaching, and it was just youth girls basketball, that I would lose a game, a key game. You know, I wouldn't get over that for weeks. It drove me nuts that I'd lose a key game that advances into the playoffs, the finals. And until you do that stuff, or just in the regular season, 
And it was just so, it's so challenging to overcome that negativity and make it into a positive situation. But if you watch the, uh, the discipline um, sermon from the church that my father and I and family go to, um, it's a great um, lesson from the Hebrew, Hebrew chapter Hebrew, um, readings and lessons about how God, um, cre- in so many ways, God doesn't take control of you. He lets you kind of do what you're going to do, and he witnesses you make mistakes and not make mistakes, but he understands that your mistakes can only hopefully discipline you how to be, make things better. There's a lot more to that. If you go to my YouTube channel, look up the discipline from this past Sunday. It's a great, it's a great lesson of life. If anybody here has watched my channel, it's just a life lesson. I'm not here to push religion onto anybody in my channel. It's just life lessons. And it's a great lesson to look at how mankind, how we operate thousands of years ago. We operate the same way thousands of years later, sadly, and the good, but in the, in, in the better too. The whole point of that is you want to try to keep you up in a, in a good environment and not in a, the wrong environment. Because I just know if I do, my daughter was to get herself in trouble on this bike, not only should we be just devastated that the bike got you know something done to it, but it would it would take away that confidence level. She's just not there yet, and uh, nothing challenging. Mr. Sanchez here, that isn't the conversation. Just sharing some reach out, and and then so back to the bikes here, the weights, the cars, and it's all about the weight. And some people say, yeah, all about the weight as well. Weight, W A I T, um, where I wait for something to come that I want to buy or get. No, we're talking about weights and like weights and measures. It's just like when you go to the gas station, there's a, there's guidelines by the states that have weights and measures. What's weights and measures? Well, these are uh, companies that go around and test the gas stations that say they're selling a gallon of fuel, and you actually get a gallon of fuel. And you'll see little certification usually on fuel pumps that show they've come by in the last six months, year, two years. Who knows what it may be? But in that industry, they have to always be. Uh, correct on how much fuel you get but you know what's interesting is i worked in the oil industry i used to sell oil back in the 80s and early 90s and i used to deliver oil and we always had this term called net and gross and so for fuel oil gasoline diesel fuel jet fuel there's a 60 degree ambient temperature that is known as a stable um stable air temperature for the volume of the fuel but when you have colder air the um, fuel contracts but when you have actually uh, hotter air the fuel expands and so the uh, so in the industry you have an option as a jobber of buying fuel you can actually uh, opt to buy off of net or gross and and typically they have like the country split from the north to the to the south of on what's the better way to buy the fuel because if you're, a, if you're a tanker truck and you roll up to a, um, to a tanking facility where you go and fill up the, uh, the tanker truck, you go to a fuel, fuel terminal, and you put the fuel, you put, let's just say, 7,000 gallons or usually 8,000 gallons. Back in the day when I was driving tanker trucks, 8,000 gallons was the maximum allowable fuel for gas and 7,200 gallons was for diesel. So you put 8,000 gallons of fuel and it just say, let's just say it's uh, 80 degrees out. When you're putting that fuel into your truck, in that tanker truck's, uh, you know, a hot tanker, that fuel's going to expand. So, but by the time you get to the gas station, put it in the ground, the fuel underground, could the tank could be 50 or 60 degrees. So there's going to be a contraction of fuel. So when you're selling the fuel to a, to a gas station, in so many ways, you're bringing them maybe 8,100 8, 100 gallons of fuel but by the time he gets it and goes in his ground, maybe it's 7,900 gallons. It kind of gets a little complicated and confusing. But that was, that's a little trick in the industry on how you uh, buy and sell fuel. And I talked about that yesterday in the storage, the tank, the Tiger tank, storage facilities and all that stuff as well. So anyways, we're just here going, mumble, mumbling along, right? Just, hey, just trying to keep the channel going and trying to keep the information going. And, and uh, we're having a good time down here, thank goodness. I really am. My mother's doing um, better than I thought she was. I mean, I'm blessed to have family that's taking good care of my mother because it's hard to see family progress. If anybody here has a mother, father, and 
you have to witness them as they get older and they're not as capable as they were it's just challenging but the good news is my mother's in better shape than i thought she was and for me um you know the last time i saw my mother was july and even my mother said to me which was very emotional for me that i may never see her again alive because she knew i had to go back and take care of a company and business and she knew i was in very challenging times and when you hear that come from a parent's mouth that's very you know it's very emotional very challenging so the good news is things are working out here for now and, and you just have to take things day by day and, and that's weight on your shoulders anybody here that's got you know a loved one that's sick or something to happen you know you lose somebody it's very challenging we all know that and for me you know i've been blessed to be in life because this is my outlet you know this is how i escape from the freaking routine of having to deal with so much you know i have so many financial obligations i even shared some very deep conversations last night which i never i wouldn't necessarily share that on my regular channel so if you really want to see some really crazy things that i've had to deal with here recently I made a very, uh, I made a very, you know, um, outright sharing information on my channel last night with my, uh, so anyways, it's called the deep, deep, deep conversations and here they come and my daughter just loves my dad like you can't believe and she just has a blast, but the landscaping project has been put off. My mother doesn't want them doing that, doesn't want my father to be exposed to that. Good Lord, she's going to run me over and go back a little bit. I'd go back a little bit, so she's not even seeing that. Yeah, right. Oh, now she's, now she's, yeah. Wow, nice, nice. Yeah, hey, there you are. The attitudes prevail. Yeah, yeah, hey, screw you, buddy. Yeah, right, here's Dad getting out of the car. So, yeah, kids, teenagers, daughters. Is it easy? I may look, I may make it look easy, but it's not. Yeah, who doesn't have a teenage kid where, uh, then we're gonna make a little bit of an attitude, yeah. So uh, here they are coming back with the breakfast. All right, let me put my coffee down, kid, and I'll get it from you, okay? Yeah, she went and got me a coffee and got me a great breakfast. And uh, so, anyways, they're gonna take the distractions here, kid. You okay? Yeah. All right. You sure? Mm -hmm. You having fun? Mm -hmm. Is popcorn doing his antics? Yeah. Is he talking to the ladies? Oh, he is. Huh, interesting. My dad has many stories of going to the store, and uh, yeah, right. This is heavy. Jesus Christ. Anyway, so uh, I think I'm going to kind of wrap it up with that. The kid and the, the popcorn, they're all going to kind of uh, get things distracted here. But I thought the way conversation would be pretty cool. More information, and just even for me, reading about the uh, carbon footprint of what us people are doing. And, you know, and it gets that gets very controversial, and I understand all that of what plays out in this physical world we live in. And we all want the best for uh, for those that are going to come right behind us. So hopefully all of us have the right attitude to try to make things better. That's the goal, right? My dad is trying to get out of the car. Here's a kid that worked out. And are your legs sore? He hit my door. Yep, well, these, well, they're, these over there fight, fighting his, uh, fighting to get out of the car. And we're all just standing there watching. We're doing it the typical, you know, person does the camera. They just sit there and they just watch the person struggle, right? Is this Crocodile Dundee coming in? Is this Crocodile Dundee coming in? <laughs> yeah. Huh? That Did you have a good time? Right. Did you have a good trip? We had a great trip. That's good. Did you learn anything? We didn't, we didn't hit anything. Nobody hit us. All right. We just got a cup of coffee in our lap. Yeah. Successful day. Except Julia couldn't pump, pump my tire up. Oh, I tell you, it's just the challenges, right? He was calling you to come out and help pump the tire up. Oh, I tell you. Wow. <laughs> I hear you. That's All it. right. Well, I got the YouTube channel coming to an end. You want to say anything? Anything to say there, kid? No. Nope. Any words of wisdom for the YouTube watchers? Watch your back. There's an Indian behind every tree. You're, you're living in dangerous territory these days. Very Watch nice. your back. Okay, well, there you go. The positive, uplifting corn words of encouragement there for everybody. So, uh, everybody, thanks for watching my channel. Have a great day. God bless. Stay safe.